please welcome Jackie Balzer. Hello. Awesome. Cool, it worked. All right, hi everyone, I'm Jackie. Um, I'm the head of front-end development at Behance, which is part of Adobe. Um, and today I want to do a bit of time traveling in keeping in theme with the conference uh, and tell you a bit about our journey over the years, um, or that. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, so just about our journey uh, over the years, growing and maintaining a large code base in an era where front-end technology is advancing and changing extremely fast. Um, so I'll go over some of our trials and tribulations, um, our growing pains, and I will even air some of our lingering dirty laundry. Um, but perhaps most importantly, how I learned to stop worrying and love the website. So, as I'm sure everyone knows, uh, the front-end web development ecosystem is uh, moving at an insanely fast pace these days. Uh, it seems like a new um, tool or methodology for authoring our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is coming out almost every single day. Um, even our design tools are integrating more closely with our development tools than ever before. A few years ago, there weren't near as many options for these things. Um, probably because complex front-end requirements like responsive web design or um, like single-page web apps weren't concerns anywhere near our radar yet. But now we're seeing these huge um, rapid advancements in everything from the languages themselves to basically how we generate every single type of code that we write to the frameworks we use to organize our code all the way to the build tools that we use to compile, optimize, and serve our code. And because there is always some better or faster tool becoming available, it can be kind of overwhelming to feel like you have to always choose and adopt the best new technology all the time. Now, I think this is hard enough to do as a seasoned developer working in a brand new greenfield project when there's no pre-existing code considerations. Um, but what if you're working in a large code base or a code base or product that has existed for a really long time? where the moment that you add something, suddenly everything that's already there becomes legacy code. Uh, and now you have multiple sets of code uh, and decisions to document, understand, maintain, and teach other people. Or what if you're someone that's just starting out uh, and you're just trying to pick a language or a framework to get started with? How do you even know where to begin or where to look? So I think when you compound these challenges with the sort of negative industry pressure that you should be using certain tools or doing things a certain way in order to be a real developer, it can create kind of a harsh environment for being able to make the best decisions. Oh, what a bummer. <laughs> I'll try and keep going. Uh, can create kind of a harsh environment for being able to make the best decisions for you, for yourself, uh, for your team, for your product, uh, and your users. We're all real developers, but all this pressure can make it hard to you know, feel like you're making the right decision, which, on the code side of things, uh, can lead to things like increased technical debt or missed project deadlines, and on the human side of things can create things, feelings like imposter syndrome or burnout. So it's super easy to compare ourselves to others, especially in an era where social media fosters so much information overload. Uh, we see other websites or hear other people's um, ideas about the best way to do things, and we think like, my website's never gonna be that good, or I'll never be as smart as that person, or they did a much better job than I did. But making this kind of comparison is kind of like comparing your life to someone's Instagram life, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's kind of unrealistic to compare your reality to someone else's extremely curated projection. Uh, you have all the information about your scenario and basically none about theirs. So today I want to pull back the curtain on Behance's Instagram life, as it were, 
uh, and show you the real side of our team's web development uh, journey and how we've dealt with all these different challenges over the years. So if you feel like you've ever experienced them or anything like them or that you might ever experience them, I want you to know it's okay and you are not alone. So this is Behance today. Uh, we've been evolving the code base since 2010, uh, which is when I joined. Uh, so about eight years ago, they had just finished a wholesale rewrite of the platform from scratch, but since then, we've just been working within that same evolving code base. Uh, we've moved through different templating engines, CSS processors, JavaScript libraries and frameworks, and of course, the site has been through a few um, evolutions of the look and feel of the design. So I joined as the fifth developer, and the dev team has grown to almost 40. We have four designers, uh, working across a couple different products. Um, and although for me personally, I started as full stack, over time I grew into focusing on the front end, in particular our CSS, and work very closely with our designers on UI and UX. Uh, and I also think about how to architect our CSS across Behance and our other applications. So in these past eight years, we've dealt with all sorts of variety of challenges. Uh, we're constantly considering which new technologies can serve us and the website and our users the best. Uh, we've had to figure out how to integrate new technology into our old technology, even when there were massive functional disparities. Uh, we've had to determine when to start uh, actually implementing these things, trying to balance product goals um, with our roadmap and our developer happiness and the health of our code. And, of course, how to clean up any messes we left behind along the way. So there's a lot of opinions out there on what the best or the right way to build a website is. I'm not here to tell you that there is any one right or wrong way to do any of these things. In fact, I'm kind of here to tell you the exact opposite. Uh, what I want to do is tell you how we've handled these challenges along the way, uh, why we made the decisions that we did, uh, and how they did or didn't work for us. And kind of reveal that no matter how pretty and put together things may look from the outside, once you pull back the curtain, uh, the reality is that no website or process is ever really as perfect as it may seem. So first, a little extra insight into Behance's complexity. Um, we, if you're not familiar with Behance, it's a platform for showcasing and discovering creative work. So that means creatives can come to our website and they can upload all sorts of different types of media from images to audio to video to just text. Uh, and then we display their work and make it easy to be discovered through a variety of different ways. So for example, your work could be featured on our homepage or displayed in one of our curated galleries uh, or even surfaced through a feed of content that is generated dynamically based on your interests. Uh, we have all sorts of different types of pages on the site. We have project pages, user profiles, team profiles. There's a job list. There's a section where we stream live video. So as of today, I counted about 50 pages on the website uh, in various states of logged in and out. Uh, that's made up of over 700 JavaScript files, about 500 SAS files, almost 1,000 markup templates, and more recently, the addition of about 300 uh, view JavaScript files. Um, not only that, it's also evolved to become more like a web app as opposed to the traditional like individually paged website, uh, where now we have way more interactive modular components that can appear across different pages of the website. For example, a messages and a notifications feed that you can view from anywhere, or things like a project pop-up or a user card that you can incite from different pages of the website as well. But we have humble beginnings. I managed to uh, get this from the Wayback Machine, so some of it is lost to time. But back when I first joined, uh, we weren't using anything aside from vanilla CSS to style the website. Uh, if I recall correctly, our design mockups were delivered as Illustrator files. Um, I would say that our development style could be classified as copy and paste driven development back then because we certainly had no tools on the front end to help us reduce any kind of repetition. We weren't using any kind of methodology for naming in the CSS or anything like that. 
Um, and so this is what the site looked like back then. And I think that anything you see there that isn't plain text or a solid color, uh, and I'm talking about things like box shadows and rounded corners and gradients, uh, was probably actually an image. Uh, and that was just because CSS wasn't nearly as robust as it is today. We were trying to create something a little more visually interesting than CSS at the time would allow. Um, now with time, we started to get comfortable using uh, CSS features for visual flair where we could, leaning more heavily on vendor prefixes, um, but understanding that the website didn't have to look exactly the same in every single browser. This is still one of my favorite single-serving websites of all time. I find it very useful. Um, and honestly, once the designers learned that we could make as many gradients as we wanted using CSS without them having to make images for them, I got to become very intimately familiar with this tool. Um, if you are not familiar with it, good on you. But basically, you just get a really easy interface for customizing gradients, and then it spits out all the 47,000 different uh, vendor rules you needed to get a gradient to work in all of the different browsers at the time. And unfortunately, we did actually need all of them, and I was not about to memorize that much syntax. So in time, as browser technology is starting to pick up more steam, CSS as a language is advancing, we're able to make our website look a little more slick and modern uh, using more native CSS rather than images, which is good. So the designers um, can spend more time you know, actually worrying about the meatier parts of designing a product. And as a bonus, the developers get to have more fun doing these kinds of little visual flair in the code side of things. So on top of all of that, we had an additional interesting challenge in that we also had all these offshoots of Behance that were um, themed galleries for different creative fields. Uh, and these sort of white label miniature Behances for schools and organizations. Uh, both of which used all of the same markup and styles as the main Behance website, but with an additional style sheet loaded to customize each one for the look and feel of the brand. Now, all of this lived within the same one code base, which of course meant that if you were changing something on the Behance website, you had to go and make sure that you weren't accidentally breaking anything on any one of these other 40 websites. No big deal. So by now, we had a clear need for a tool that would help us with our CSS development. Uh, not only were vendor prefixes starting to slip through the cracks, having to do them manually, but thanks to all those themed sites and galleries, our code base was absolutely inundated with copy and pasted CSS, where for the most part, the only differences were things like colors or font names. Uh, additionally, because those white labeled sites were you know, relatively similar themes off the same base, our designers were cranking out designs for them disproportionately faster than the development team was able to keep up with making them. Fortunately, by this time, CSS preprocessors were really starting to pick up steam, and they were looking like they were going to be the perfect tool to help us whip our CSS into shape uh, and to um, help us build out these sites faster and copy and paste way less code. Now, the story I'm about to tell isn't about the merits of any one CSS preprocessor over the other, um, but I do want to use it as an example of um, a real world example of the messy path to choosing, implementing, and actually using a new tool. So at the time, we were debating between Less and SAS. They were the two most popular ones at the time. Uh, both great tools on their own, uh, but we needed to do proper due diligence and pick the one that was going to work best for our use case. Um, so Less had a really solid offering on some super useful basics, um, but we were extremely enticed by all of the additional functionality that SAS was offering as well. Um, Ultimately, we decided SAS had a more compelling uh, implementation and features for our specific needs. Uh, and Compass, a framework for SAS on top of that, offered a ton of extra power that was going to be like, just literally perfect for our theming needs and all of our sprite management. So really, the answer like, could not have been more clear. SAS and Compass were going to change our lives. We obviously went with less. Why would we do that? Um, in our case, we ended up going with less for a couple reasons. Um, at the time, you could only compile SAS with Ruby, uh, and since Behance wasn't built on a Ruby stack, um, it wasn't easy for us to even start experimenting with using it. Um, at the time, there was this really convenient little GUI app that you could download for your computer to compile less code, 
um, which is super simple for someone who's not very technically inclined. Um, and so it had a really low barrier to entry for us. Um, we were an extremely small dev team at this point. We didn't have a ton of resources, but this meant that we could start getting the benefits of a CSS preprocessor much faster and with less friction and engineering time than if we had actually like, sat down and tried to figure out how to implement proper Ruby SAS at that point. It afforded us kind of another side benefit, though, in that we were able to use less as a proof of concept that implementing any CSS preprocessor was actually a worthwhile investment. Uh, the time it took to implement it and get it up and running for everyone to use paid off drastically in development time and improvements down the line. So that, in turn, meant that we were able to get team buy-in for actually adopting SaaS, uh, as well as negotiate for the development time needed to do so, and ultimately make the switch to the tool that we felt was going to serve us best. But our journey does not end there. Uh, although we had decided the higher investment in SaaS was going to be worth it, we did have to cut some corners to get there. Um, to complicate things, we now had the dreaded technical debt of having a code base that was partially vanilla CSS, uh, partially less syntax, and those would have to be converted over to SaaS syntax. Um, and probably the biggest one, we still didn't have a stack that could uh, run Ruby or compile SaaS for us. But what we realized that we could do was have everyone install Ruby and SAS on their own individual machines, and we could compile and commit the SAS and compiled CSS to the repository individually from there. Now, we violated a lot of web development best practices by compiling CSS on our own machines and committing it to the repository instead of doing it with a tool within the website stack. Um, and honestly, we, the worst crime may have been that we were committing it to the repository. Um, now, I doubt that you will ever find a medium think piece advocating for this kind of implementation. Uh, and it gives me anxiety to admit on stage that we were committing such an egregious violation of best practices by having literally hundreds of compiled code files committed to our repository. But on the flip side, uh, I also can't overstate how much benefit we gained by having SAS available to us. Um, for what sounds like, I'm sure, a nightmare situation on the surface, I have to say, for the most part, actually worked really well for us. Uh, suddenly, we were able to build those themed galleries and sites in a fraction of the time that we were before, which meant that we were helping our users in our mission uh, to give more exposure to creatives. Plus, our designers were happy because they were getting to see their designs built and put out into the world much faster. Uh, on top of all of that, we were able to do it with way less code than before, which meant that the code base became easier to understand and maintain. Um, and although committing compiled code is a bad practice, for a large code base with a lot of interdependencies, it actually ended up giving us extremely clear visibility into the reach that any single change was actually having on the website. Uh, it also meant that we had tools now to do some grunt work for us, so our designers, again, could focus spending their time on the issues that really matter mattered, rather than spending time stitching together sprites for us and things like that. So in this case, we were able to find a balance between a subpar technical implementation uh, and overwhelming developer and designer happiness, as well as code health by reducing a lot of our CSS technical debt and increasing our development speed. But what happens if you need a tool that doesn't seem to exist yet? Uh, around this time, we started working on another product. It was a single page web app for task management that we called Action Method Online. Uh, being that it was a brand new product, we were starting from scratch, uh, we had a rare and excellent opportunity to try out some new technologies without having to worry about retrofitting any existing code into any new frameworks or paradigms. Um, we stuck with SAS for the CSS, but uh, on the JavaScript side, we decided to look into implementing a JavaScript framework into one of our products for the first time. So we started building this product in 2011 um, at a time when uh, actual JavaScript frameworks, as opposed to just libraries or utilities, um, were kind of only just starting to pop up and take hold. So we ended up making the decision to write our own JavaScript MVC framework, which we called nbd.js. 
Uh, we told ourselves that it meant no big deal, just saying, because we love a funny name for a tool. Um, but we built it at a time when Angular and Backbone were already kind of pretty popular in VC frameworks, so why bother writing our own, right? But if you look at the timeline, we're actually doing this at a time when there weren't really that many options out there, and the ones that were gaining the most traction were still pretty new. Um, I think adopting young technology in a product that you think or hope is going to live on for many years is kind of a non-zero risk move. Now, I'm not saying that writing your own JavaScript framework uh, or using an existing one is better or worse than the other, but for the size of our team uh, and the needs of our product at the time, being able to iterate on our own front-end framework was actually exactly what we needed in that moment. And what ended up happening was that Action Method Online actually became a really good proving ground for NBD. Uh, we were able to prove its worthiness in a practical, real-world setting, and actually because it was born and forged for these new, specific, interactive, and data-driven purposes that we had never had a need for before, uh, we were actually able to start using it back over on Behance for some of the more new, complex features that we were starting to build there as well. So by this time, 2013, Behance is evolving from its static website roots and becoming responsible for, or responsive for the first time. Now, executing this kind of huge paradigm shift was actually a massive undertaking for us. Um, nothing about how the site was designed or built up to this point was conducive to being responsive. The way the layout was built was completely rigid. Uh, the existing design wasn't immediately adaptable to smaller screen sizes. Uh, there was no design system to uh, organize this kind of massive visual update around. And we were still certainly lacking the front-end tools that we needed to really cleanly structure and implement the responsive functionality that we really wanted to provide. So we were faced with a special challenge. Uh, whereas our previous updates that we had been making to Behance weren't really fundamentally or structurally different, both from a design perspective and a code perspective, uh, they tended to be more like coats of paint or just new sections added into the existing uh, setup. This one actually introduced a massive visual, functional, and structural changes. Uh, so the time came for us to decide did we want to do a full rewrite of Behance from scratch again, or should we do this upgrade incrementally? Now, I think what happens when you see a new design for your website uh, is you look at your current one and your new one side by side, and you think, oh my god, look how nice and clean and simplified that new design is. It looks so pretty. We've built a much uglier, harder one already. Um, we've learned all the lessons. We've done all the hard stuff before. We can definitely do it so much better if we start from scratch this time around. But this is where a success bias or a sur survivorship bias comes into play. Um, it can actually lead you to forget about your past failures. Uh, I think it looks easy because when you're looking at your current website, you're looking at something that's already working. Uh, and when you're looking at that slick, improved, shiny new design, it literally deceives you with its clean, simplified beauty. Um, but your working product is the result of overcoming trial and error and failures. And by throwing away the code that taught you those lessons in the first place, you're likely to simply rediscover the same or similar problems as before, which ultimately delays any kind of idealistic release date you may have had in mind at the beginning of this thought process anyway. So, despite the challenges that we knew we had in place with the existing foundation, we knew that a rewrite was just simply out of the question for us, uh, and an incremental update would suit our team and the product much better. So, with this in mind, we started work on our first ever pattern library and style guide. Um, with the intention that these modular reusable components would help us in our endeavor to update the website to be responsive in smaller pieces and get things out the door for our users to use a little bit quicker. So today we hear a lot of talk about design systems, but I think at the time the idea of an actual fully comprehensive design system wasn't really uh, on the scene yet. So we built these modular components, we displayed them neatly in a style guide on the Behance website, uh, that anyone could view. Uh, 
and uh, we built them using Mustache, SAS, our NBD JavaScript framework. We even started our own little internal uh, SAS library that we called Juliana, which was intended to help provide a structural foundation for these different UI elements, not only on Behance, but hopefully on our other applications as well. Um, and then, just as we went along, updating individual pages of the website to have this new responsive design, we would just replace the code that was building out all the old UI components with ones from this new um, component library. So what that meant is that for some time, we had something that kind of looked like this. Uh, we had these old, long-standing sections of the website surrounded by these bright, beautiful, shiny, new, responsive sections that we'd been working on updating. Not only that, but if you were browsing the website on a small device, you may end up with two vastly different experiences, um, sometimes having a page that was optimized for your smaller screen, and then sometimes navigating to a page that was still optimized only for use on desktop. Now, once again, I doubt that you would ever find an article suggesting that having some pages be responsive and other pages not responsive is a good user experience, um, but we had to find a balance between a lot of different factors. Uh, we had to consider the balance of everything from the roadmap of products and features that we wanted to work on um, to the time that we needed to spend on technical debt and things that weren't necessarily user-facing features um, to our stakeholder interest to the benefit that we could actually provide our users in any given amount of time. And ultimately, I think in the end, it worked out. Um, although it may have been kind of weird for some users sometimes, uh, we tried to mitigate that by prioritizing upgrading the highest traffic pages first. Uh, so hopefully you were at least less likely to encounter this weirdness if you were navigating the site on your phone. Um, and if nothing else, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we didn't super upset or scare away or lose any of our users during this transition time just because we had a slightly non-ideal implementation along the way. So uh, these tools and best practices carried us well into about 2015 when uh, all the while working on continuing to upgrade Behance to be responsive in pieces, uh, when we started to work on another brand new single page web app, this time a website builder called Adobe Portfolio, uh, which stood to be the most complex web application that we've built to date. Um, we also had new technical challenges on Portfolio that we never had to deal with before. Uh, what we wanted to do was build a full graphic user interface, what you see is what you get, website editor, uh, where by using literally one of any hundreds of dialogues, uh, you could make a change to your own personal website, uh, see it reflected in our editor in real time, but all while maintaining an editor Chrome that didn't interfere or intersect with those user customizations in any way. So we started building Portfolio with all of these tools that we had been using on Behance and Action Method. But uh, building and maintaining your own tools is not without its risks and downsides either. Um, by now, we'd been starting to feel a lot of the growing pains of actually using our own homegrown frameworks and libraries. For example, with our SaaS library, Juliana. Um, it actually had become so over-engineered that nobody even wanted to use it anymore. Uh, I think there was this mentality that since it was our little library that we controlled for our products, we had this sense that we should just make it as useful for any infinite possible use case as possible. But all that does really is end up with like massively over-engineered code. Um, not only that, but it was difficult to update and distribute the package, so nobody ever even wanted to put in the effort to clean it up. It was easier to just write whatever new code you wanted and copy and paste it wherever you needed it again. Uh, and we came to learn a lot about the practical day-to-day -day realities of actually using and maintaining your own JavaScript framework. Um, NBD was originally built by just one of our developers and maintained by only a couple more. Um, and that meant that it didn't move particularly fast. So other open source frameworks on the scene were advancing at a much higher rate. Um, so that meant not only were we missing out on the benefits that these advancements could give our products, but we would have been losing time by trying to implement those same features or similar ones into our own framework when they already exist somewhere else. Um, it also meant that it was much more challenging for new hires to learn it, and this, I think, is a big one. 
Um, documentation was sparse because the developers were mostly busy actually working on the framework or working on the features for our websites. Um, and it also meant the universe of resources to get help was scoped entirely to just a small portion of our dev team. You couldn't go on Stack Overflow and find out you know, how to use something in our own like, closed source framework. Um, of course, that means it's much harder for someone to be self-sufficient if you're trying to learn this framework for the first time. Um, on the flip side, popular open source frameworks have bustling ecosystems around them. They have the benefit of more active communities to tap into for help. Um, so that only means you not only have a much bigger pool of resources to get help from, but it also means that there's a community that you can give back to when you solve a particularly challenging issue as well. So by then, it was easy for us to acknowledge that our homegrown tools uh, were no longer the best for our team or for the types of products and features that we were building. Uh, up to this point, we'd done pretty well making our JavaScript modular with NBD. Uh, we'd done the best that we could uh, scoping and componentizing our CSS uh, as much as possible by using the BEM methodology and some really nice SaaS features. But as our websites and our web apps became increasingly complex, uh, the truly scoped nature of these burgeoning CSS in JavaScript tools and frameworks um, were becoming impossibly enticing. Um, as our product needs evolved and our needs advanced, the current tools were just simply becoming way too outdated to help us anymore. So we had sort of an interesting perfect storm of timing for our team. Um, after spending about a year and a half, maybe two years, pretty focused on Portfolio's development, um, we split some of the team back off of Portfolio and back onto Behance. Um, we'd been feeling the need for some ad more advanced tech than we had on Portfolio, um, and during the time that we'd actually been building it, our designers had been working on a whole new uh, look and feel for the Behance website. Um, but this time, we wanted to make its release a big splash. Uh, we wanted a whole full release to the world that would change the look of pretty much every single page on the website all at once. But once again, without rebuilding Behance from scratch. Um, as an additional challenge, this time around, it was actually an even more widespread update. Um, whereas we were making individual pages or groups of pages responsive, but with generally the same look and feel the first time around, um, this time, not only were we going to change the components that were being used across the site, but we wanted to change the fundamental underlying code away from our you know, custom tools to our new ones, uh, and we wanted the whole site to get the benefit of these new tools and frameworks all at once. So with a big overhaul on our plates and a technical need to fill on portfolio, the time was once again ripe to look towards new technology. Now, in the same way that the industry at large has opinions on the best tools uh, to use, so does any given dev team. So what we did was we held group discussions, lunch and learns, um, knowledge sharing sessions for anyone who was interested. You didn't even have to be on the front end team if you wanted to join, uh, where we would discuss the pros and cons of every single different framework and uh, scope CSS solution under the sun. Uh, and what we would do is we would try out the best candidates on the admin sections of our websites, which are just areas of the site that only employees can access. Um, but it works as a means of giving us a very near real world uh, proving ground for these different tools without having to worry about impacting the user facing side of things. So ultimately, we did decide to go with Vue and CSS modules uh, as our preferred tools. Um, but by now, this story probably sounds pretty familiar. We've kind of come full circle on needing new tools, investigating new tools, actually choosing the new tool, and then finally implementing it. And although the, technical, the specific technical implementation details may differ, um, the ideas and methods that we use to actually get the job done pretty much are the same. Uh, we exclusively built new features using Vue and CSS modules, which meant that we could start putting them into use right away. Um, we rebuilt existing UI components, um, such as buttons and inputs, using Vue and CSS modules. And we built them alongside their existing implementations, um, which we would then just use the new ones as we were updating the website. 
And we were able to do this, perhaps most importantly, by building all of these things behind feature flags. Um, that's just a check in the code that serves one set of code or another, depending on what we call the user's gatekeeper setting. Um, and that meant that we could build all of this code and make all of these changes alongside the existing website with ever actually, without ever actually interfering with it, uh, while also still having the ability to see all of this new stuff in action in production before it was ready for its public debut. And this actually brings us to where we are today. Um, the website is not fully converted to view in CSS modules yet, but we continue to follow this same practice uh, as we update and develop new features across the site, and we are releasing these changes in various degrees, um, honestly, multiple times pretty much every single day. So if you look at the arc of front-end development on Behance over the last eight years, um, it's changed pretty drastically. Uh, in 2010, our biggest concerns were around perfecting the slickest looking gradient and getting the website to look pixel perfect to the mock-ups. Um, but by 2018, not only are we concerned with how the website looks, but we also have to think about how to optimize our code for the least repetition, how to get the best performance, um, how to handle complex state and data management, how to work more closely and seamlessly seamlessly with our designers, um, and also how to make our website function in more browsers and on more devices than literally ever before. Uh, since the CSS has become more closely intertwined with our JavaScript and markup in modern frameworks than ever before, uh, our concerns are no longer uh, isolated to just the CSS or just the JavaScript independently. And because the CSS and JavaScript languages move so fast as well, uh, we end up having a much bigger and more robust ecosystem that we need to have a deeper understanding of. Front-end development is hard. Um, but I encourage empathy in your decision-making and interactions around it. Uh, every technical choice is relative, and there is no one right or wrong way to build a website. So, in case the example so far didn't illustrate the beautiful, messy path that web development can take, um, I will use this time now to air a little bit of Behance's dirty laundry. Uh, so in case you've ever felt bad about any of the skeletons in your code base's closet, hopefully this next section will help you feel like you are not alone. So some fun facts. I'll start with an easy one. We're not using a design system. Um, that's okay. You can still build a good website without a design system. Uh, we do have a set of reusable components and a cohesive style that everything is designed in, but ultimately, it's not a design system. Uh, on the technical side, we are still using three different uh, template rendering engines, uh, which is just a relic of all the tech transitions that we've made over time. Um, and depending on which part of the site you're viewing, such as this one, sometimes you are seeing all three rendering engines in action at once. Um, this just happens to be the very first page that you see when you log into Behance. Uh, as an aside, if you'll notice these two buttons, which happen to look awfully similar, uh, they're not sharing a single line of code yet. Uh, one of them is just built in our old framework. One of them is now one of our uh, view components. So, you know, it's just a matter of getting the upgrade there. Um, I ran stats uh, for the, one of the main CSS files on our site. And as you can see, we have a lot of different shades of gray. Um, I'm actually, if I'm honest, not too upset about this because this is down by almost half. Uh, I ran this a few years ago, and I think we had over 60 shades of gray. And honestly, if nothing else, at least we're consistent with our brand blue, so I feel good about that. Uh, next, I searched our code base for some to-dos because I figured there could be some fun stuff in there, and I immediately came across this one in the head tag of a section of our website. Uh, it says, to-do, there is a lot of stuff included here that is just unnecessary. That sounds pretty bad, and also isn't really actionable. Um, I had never noticed this before, though, so I checked the git blame, because I wanted to see how long this had been a problem for. <laughs> so how about our CSS? Uh, I found this one in the CSS file for the page that I showed before, that first page that you uh, see when you log in, and it says, to do. This is a temporary fix. The JavaScript for this should be adding the proper Z index. These are my favorite fixes, just blindly applying a massively high z-index 
These are the best. Well, no worry, it's only temporary, so let's see. I think that means it's permanent. Um, but here's a longer one. It says to do. This is due to Chrome 43.0.2357.65 introducing a phantom subpixel width enlargement on parent containers. Remove when fixed. Okay, well, that's nice and detailed, although I'm not immediately clear why a width property is a problem here. But whatever, let's see if Chrome has been updated since this was written. Uh, seems like it's been a while. I'm going to hazard a guess. Uh, on top of all of that, there is a page on our website that we never made responsive. It's not even like it doesn't get traffic. Honestly, it's not the most popular part of the website, but people do go to this page. Um, we just never prioritized it. Um, don't tell anyone, but we are actually finally upgrading it right now. We're working on it. Uh, and finally, my personal favorite. Uh, if you remember how I said we started committing our compiled CSS to the repository back in 2011, well, we did that for over five years. Uh, we finally stopped doing it about two years ago, but still extremely long after many viable options had become available. Uh, sometimes it just takes a while to repay the technical debt. So if it sounds like I'm saying our website is kind of messy and imperfect, good. That is what I'm saying. Um, but ultimately, I'm proud to say that I work at Behance. Uh, even now that you all know how the sausage is made, uh, it's not perfect. But the difference between not perfect and bad is all in how closely you focus on it. The closer you examine something, the worse it's going to seem. Um, but everything that we've built is a result of hard work and smart ideas and amazing teamwork. Um, I think I'm lucky to work with such a driven and compassionate group of people who care deeply about the work that they create, the product that they're building, and how it impacts the lives of the people who actually use it. And ultimately, these are the values that I think make our industry what it is uh, and are way more important than being able to say you use any of the latest frameworks or have the most pristine or perfect code base. Thank you.